outside and try to bring people in. So this this uh, we're back again with the Minoc Peering Forum. Um, I think uh, some of you are referring this to this as the Middle East Peering Forum. We like it to be called Minoc Peering Forum. Uh, minor difference, but uh, we want to stick with calling it a Minoc Peering Forum. Um, doesn't mean that there cannot be another Middle East Peering Forum, and I hope there is someday. But for now, we'll stick with it. Uh, so this session, we have three speakers, uh, Christian and Christian and Martin. Uh, Christian Kochman uh, from Akamai will talk about Akamai CDN architecture and how they do peering. Uh, then we have Christian from the NCC talking about the RIPE Atlas and RIPE stat. And then we'll have Martin Levy not of Hurricane Electric, talking about any cast CDN. Uh, so, Christian, and I hope your slides are here. Oh, kind of hope that too. Monday, this is BF3, and I hope this is the Christian. Is this yours or this is the NCC? This. Nope. 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 That's not a good start. You have a look. I start randomly talking. So, when I handed in the, the first draft for the slides, which we try to find now, I was told that they have too much marketing, so I took more marketing out and made it much more complicated and technical. So if you want to complain about that, then go to the program committee. But um, they are also now much more entertaining and interesting too, so if you're thankful for it, still go to the program committee and say thanks. As we're looking still for the slides and try to find them, who of you in the audience has a technical background, does anything with BGP and understands parts of this whole traffic engineering, blah, blah, blah? Okay, who has already no clue what I'm talking about? Uh, one, kinda ish. Good. Uh, I talk a little bit very quickly about Akamai and how we work and afterwards I go actually through three examples, scenarios, where we work a little bit different from a BGP and traffic engineering perspective as we are an overlay network in comparison to what you are used to from a telco or even probably from other um, CDNs like a Limelight Level 3. And I talk a little bit about scenarios we were coming across where things are fundamentally broken because people were quite creative on the other side with their BGP announcements and what they tried to achieve. And as we work slightly different, once in a while there's a little bit of gap and then there are issues and things get complicated. So it's kind of a awareness on one side, but it is also a what should you not do. Or if you're really desperate and want to break it, then that would be your introduction how to. This slide was done by a, by a colleague of me, um, well, in conjunction with me, and they're actually technical slides. So there's pretty much nothing turning, spinning, or burning. So in comparison to the normal marketing slides I have, um, they're kind of boring. But they have a lot of fluffy clouds and AS numbers on it, so. Okay. Press, perfect. Uh, I have a look. Oops, it automatically plays, can we? Good, otherwise I scream for help. Good, let's start. No, it's, it's fine, I can have a look over there, or there, 
So, one marketing slide nevertheless, just to give you a rough idea, because we like to talk about numbers, um, how the Akamai platform looks like right now. Just a short look at the amount of servers, which is kind of interesting, and probably the traffic, the total traffic peak, and uh, the third number, which is kind of interesting, uh, that makes it in, um, later interesting why the whole traffic engineering is actually important because there's quite a significant amount of traffic coming from us. So if you are unhappy about where the traffic comes or how the whole routing and thing works, um, if you do it right or wrong, you know, there's quite a lot of amount of traffic shifting from the left to the right link or so. So you might want to be a little bit careful because you might affect quite a bit of traffic. That's basically message of this slide. So, in general, um, to break it down and making it kind of easy, there are two kind of CDNs from a high level view, uh, the ones which have an own AS number and act more or less like a transit provider or like a network. They have an AS number, they peer with you, they might sell you transit or not, depending on their business model, and all their servers, or at least the majority of them, are in their network. So if you want to have content from these networks, you normally peer by transit and then you get it via a normal BGP session from them. Uh, they often work with Anycast and then they have one or the other kind of logic to distribute the traffic between the different clusters or send you to the closest one. Quite different is the Akamai approach uh, for two parts. One is it is an overlay network. We do not have a backbone. So you normally get the traffic from like three kind of sources. You either get it from an on-net cluster, which is a cluster, a couple of servers in an eyeball network, hopefully in your eyeball network, and then it's quite close. Or you get it from a peering connection, could be private interconnect, could be a public peering session. That's actually what we talk a bit uh, about today. Or if you do not have one of the first two, then you would get it from a transit connection. We do not work with any cast for the mapping, basically, you sending you to the content. We work with DNS and we try to figure out where you and your resolver are and then we send you to the cluster which we believe has the closest connection to you, the best connectivity, the highest throughput and serve you from there. This is an example of a resolver. If you basically make to a particular customer of us or an Akamized content, a DNS lookup, and you do that in different locations, then you get different answers. The reason behind that is because you get sent to different clusters. So this is how we do the mapping. A domain pointing to a cryptic Akamai C name, pointing to an IP, and the IP is a cluster which is close to you. Good, peering. some water. So, we had it in, in the panel today and actually most of the arguments for peering were already mentioned and you, you might know them so I'll try to go through them quite quickly. So one reason is besides the cost saving, which is you know kind of an obvious one on one side, is actually everything around performance related. So often, especially if you had multiple IXs, the IX or the multiple IX connections are closer probably uh, to your network or to particular user and customers of you than the transit part would be, so we get a better performance, especially as our service is then straight behind the IX, serving from there instead of you know a transit connection where our cluster could be further away. So you get a lower latency, which also means you actually get a higher throughput, as Steve mentioned today in the panel. This is especially interesting for HD videos and every large object because it affects your TCP window and how much throughput you get through. So if a cluster is closer to you, the generic rule is then the performance is higher, not just from a latency but also from a throughput perspective. You can burst easier, well, we can to you. Um, it reduces the peering cost, as I mentioned before. It actually, if we peer, because we get your BGP sessions 
and your prefixes, we get a better idea where the different networks, the name servers, and the end users in the world are. So our network intelligence to figure out which is the best cluster for you gets more information. So that is a nice side effect for us. For the peering, we not just can deliver the traffic, we actually make our mapping better. Even if you have on-net servers, servers in your own network, which are dedicated for you and your end users, it actually makes sense to peer with us because if they are either down, full, if there is an event or something happens, then instead of going to transit, you actually go to peering first after you uh, exceed the capacity of your on-net servers and therefore have an additional path which is cheaper than transit and gives you also more redundancy. Good. Uh, I mentioned the performance part, the cost reduction. Uh, it's quite obvious if you do not pay transit because you can peer it away. Even if the peering port costs you many money and the infrastructure, it is a fixed cost, not a per Mbit cost usually, and that makes your whole business case cheaper. There's also the part if you do not have to backhaul it from probably another country and you have it actually in your country or in various cities if you peer on multiple locations with us then you also save backbone costs and backholding costs. And uh, it has a marketing component and actually a revenue component. If you can say that you, you know, have direct access to content and that's true for um, multiple content players and you peer with them and have a direct connection, then rather seeing them via transit and a shared medium with all the other traffic you have then I think it is also, from a marketing perspective, interesting for your customers and end users. And of course your peer, because you're nice. So, what are we doing at internet exchanges? Well, first of all, if you peer with us in multiple locations, what you actually see is always a different prefix. Because as we do not any cast for the clusters, you see the prefix and the IP addresses of that particular node. So from our side, you actually get an inconsistent route announcement and you just get the local cluster. You also don't see a lot of IP addresses, you know, a couple of 24s, depending on how many servers we need because the servers just need one or two IP addresses and uh, then you can put quite some servers in it. So the IP space we announce to you at the particular locations is actually quite small. That's how it looks like. And again, referring back to the panel today, as I said, our clusters, even if we peer with you, as they do not have a backbone connection to other clusters, as there is no backbone, we have to get the content somehow into the network. And we do that via transit. So this cluster to feed the cache for the objects which are not in the cache yet, has to go via transit to our customer, to the origin server, pull it in, and then we can distribute it multiple times. So every one of these internet exchanges actually needs a transit connection. And this might be one uh, of the reasons why the economics for us, if you go to a region where the transit price is really high, are quite different than in like the Western Hemisphere uh, like in Europe or so, where the transit price is much lower and therefore the economics are quite different. It, this mapping system, as I called it, basically the software which figures out which cluster is the closest to you and then delivers back via DNS that particular IP of a server you should go to. This mapping system needs a certain time to adjust. So it is quite good in failovers when, you know, one cluster goes down and has a problem, you get redirected to another one. But till a prefix actually shows up, a new path, a new route, might take up to a day. So that means if you peer with us in a particular location, it is quite possible that the traffic doesn't ramp up immediately, but it takes a while till we actually process it, understand that this is a new path where we can reach you, 
put that into context with all the other clusters we have, and then make a decision which end users we are sending there. If you have the opportunity, you should peer with us in multiple locations and have a mix between on-net and peering cluster because not every cluster can actually hold all the traffic. The total content we have now from our customers is much, much bigger than would actually fit in even in our biggest cluster. As clusters have different size, different locations, they also have different economics, there's actually a certain difference in content in it. So peering at multiple locations might actually mean you get, you know, a particular website from cluster A and a particular website from cluster B because they are, depending on the product the customer bought from us, not necessarily in all the clusters. So having more peerings, more redundancy is a good thing. Similar like a internet provider which purely relies on BGP where you have normally like a in a simple scenario, a three-tiered uh, local pref structure. We have local preference in BGP and the highest local preference goes to your customer because that is where you want to send your traffic first. The second one, you normally have peering because you prefer peers over your transit and the third one is basically transit where you want to send as less traffic as possible. A similar concept actually happens on our side. So the different clusters we prefer to a different degree the clusters which are on net, the ones which are in your network, if you have them, and which are closest to the eyeballs are the ones which we prefer first. Afterwards, we prefer the one from an internet exchange because they're normally still closer and more cost effective. And in the last case, if we can't reach you like one or the other one version, then we uh, serve you via transit and that's then our fallback, similar like you would too. Good. So far so good. Everybody still with me? Now we're coming to the fancy slides. If you use BGP, there are of course different BGP attributes and criteria you can use to manip well, manipulate or influence your traffic. I have chosen um, like the two or three most common ones and one of them is AS path prepending. If you have seen router output before, if you look at the red numbers, you are the one AS1001 and if you want to prepend a path, you put a route map or you know, policy depending on whatever router you use and then you prepend that path, it gets longer and therefore less attractive. So what happens actually if you start to do that in direction to Akamai? You tell Akamai, well, we prepend in your direction because I actually have two links with you and I don't want to send the traffic via link A, so I prepend multiple times, see what happens. Well, funny enough, what happens is actually pretty much nothing. The reason for that is, even if we take BGP into account, as we are an overlay network and as we go after performance, we look for pings and trace routes and different performance characteristics and criteria, and then make a decision how we serve you. So if one link has a much better performance than another link, but this is where the prepend is on. We see that prepend. The router actually would react, but because the mapping system sends you to that particular cluster and makes a decision that is the closest one, then the prepend actually doesn't come into effect. So if you wanna, if you have multiple connections to the same router from us, which barely happens, then it would make a difference because the router, of course, listens to prepends and takes that into account, but the mapping system does not. So if you want to do prepends, and we come to that later, and have an influence which link you want to use and prefer, then you've got to do something else and talk to us. Similar with METs, if you set METs to have an influence how the traffic gets handed over to you, and um, again you see a metric zero and you see nothing because it's the overlay, but the, the metric is set in the set, second example. Well, not even every BGP provider actually on the other side honors your mats if you set them, so most of the times you have to call them anyway or talk to them, see if they honor them and react to it. But uh, if you give them to us, 
then we would ignore them or not honor them. The mapping system doesn't know about them and does not take them into account. A very common traffic exercise also is more specifics. So you have a big block, but um, you want to actually highlight a certain traffic on, again, you have kind of two links and you want to split up the traffic or do kind of interesting load balancing. Then what you do is you break them up into more specifics. That is uh, one of the reasons why we see so many prefixes in the routing table because everybody starts to de-aggregate and send the 24s left and right. And um, exactly as in, in this example where we break a 20 into multiple 24s and uh, then it becomes a more specific in the routing table. Uh, but it actually, as we point you via the resolver and via the IP you are using, if it is part of a 20 or 24, at the moment where we make the decision to which cluster we are sending you, it doesn't make a difference. And again, it makes a difference if you connect it to a router, which is big, and you see that particular router, like at an internet exchange, DKIX or so, for example, then it would make a difference, because if he sees you via two path, and you are mapped to that, then he sends you to the one where the more specific is on. So normal BGP routing, no surprise there. But for the decision, if we send you to the DKIX or to the AMSEX, for example, the more specific wouldn't matter. Again, it would be a question of performance and not a question of BGP routing. The whole idea for the Akamai mapping system was actually to take the issues which BGP has to a certain degree, which means it is not aware of latency, of quality. As long as the BGP session is up and the path is not too much congested, it wouldn't care. You know, it looks for the shortest AS path and a couple of other criteria, but from a latency perspective, it doesn't care. This is the reason why you have these examples where the traffic kind of trombones, you know, over the oceans and stuff like that, because the BGP doesn't care for the latency part. To eliminate that problem and actually to be aware of the quality and the latency, we built that overlay network and all this intelligence around, which in that case also means to a certain point we have to ignore what is underneath, using it for the basic routing, but put more intelligence over it. So, as I said before, the mapping system and the Akamai part is over BGP. We are using it, but it is not the only criteria. It is different from BGP routing. It is a software stack, a software uh, tool with a lot of input, which looks after the routing, after performance, after facts, if the cluster actually has enough capacity, is not too busy, all that kind of stuff. But routing alone is not the tiebreaker or not what makes actually the decision. Good, so now we come to the more interesting parts. Uh, I have three scenarios. The first one is inconsistent route announcements. So this is when you are ASP A on one side and you actually have a slash 20 and you want to load balance over both parts. You know, you send the 20 to the left and the 20 to the right side. But then for example, you see that the Akamai traffic is closest to your lower transit provider because we peer with him, we get the 20, we surf him from there and you see more traffic on the lower link probably than on the upper, uh, upper link because the cluster is closer to the lower transit provider than it is to the uh, upper one in this example. So ISPA now want to load balance that or actually move the traffic because the upper transit provider is cheaper and then he starts breaking out more specifics. So what it does here is, you see the, the 20 is always the case on both links. You see it up and down. But then on top, he has broken out two 24s to attract more traffic on the upper transit provider. So what is actually now happening in that example? Well, what happens is, 
And that is a, a side effect of how we build clusters and how the routing and the mapping not all the time are completely in sync. The cluster at the internet exchange has most of the times just the default route because he just needs transit to get the content into the cache. He then has all the routes at an IX from the peers which we peer with. So that includes, you know, the normal routes, but also their more specifics. So as we just get the slash 20 from the lower transit provider from 2002, we send still all the traffic, and that is performance-wise actually the closest, we send it to him. He itself actually gets the 20 from the customer. That's what he announces further. But he also gets the more specific from his peers, which is also the second transit provider. So now his router decides to send the traffic for the more specifics to his peer and then to ISPA. So ISPA itself still has full reachability. It just gets the traffic a little bit different. You wouldn't even notice. And you know, that happens all day long. Unfortunately, sometimes an ISP figures out that this isn't how it should be and he becomes creative and he actually starts filtering out things. In this case, the transit provider, the lower one, 2002, was very creative because instead of filtering the prefix, he actually filtered the traffic hard. So he still had a route for the more specifics to the upper transit provider 3003, but then he actually dropped the traffic on his interface. So he pretty much black holed the traffic from us for his own customer, which was supposed to go via the second transit provider. This, of course, doesn't help anyone and basically makes the website unreachable. So, going back, if you announce a route, and I, I have that example in, uh, later on as well in a, in a different scenario. If you announce a route to an ISP, then there is a certain perception that you can reach these prefixes. If you then start to filter somewhere in between, especially not on a prefix level, but actually filter out the traffic, then you break that promise. The promise which was, send the traffic for that 20 to me and I forward it on. It, if you honor the prefixes from the other transit provider, the more specifics, then you also have to deliver the traffic. You can filter out the prefixes itself and don't allow the more specifics because then the traffic goes just through through the customer and everything is fine again. But if you accept the more specifics, you cannot filter the traffic. Funny enough, it actually hurts your own customer. You break the connectivity for your own customer. So if you have a promise, if you announce a route, you also have to reach it. Otherwise, and that was an example in Hong Kong, it goes nowhere. So far, so good. Gets rather more complicated from here. Good, another example we have seen and things you should not do. That is a little bit more complicated even. So in that case, same scenario. The difference is now that ASPA on the right side gets a little bit more intelligent. I have a little bit issues to see that as I don't see it on my screen here. He announces One, so, one moment. Sorry, that's a, the, still the same example. So if you filter, filter on, uh, if you put ACLs in, then put the ACLs in on the traffic and not on the, uh, sorry, on the prefixes and not on the traffic, especially if you deal with the more specifics.
one of the sol uh, a couple of the solutions how to actually fix that or how the traffic would not be broken. So one option could be transit provider, the upper one, actually has a link to the IX and to the cluster from which we peer with the other transit provider because then we would see the more specific ourselves and actually split the traffic to the left and to the right. So in that case it would work. If, again as I said, if he wouldn't filter, it would work. And uh, then the ASPA on the right side can actually use even more specifics, you know, and do them left and right and split it even more. And then he actually really can load balance because then he can shift the, the prefixes around. He goes to the same cluster, but which link is the inbound link, he then can define much better than even in the first scenario. But um, to actually know that and to understand that, um, unfortunately, he would actually have to talk to us and or his transit provider to actually figure out what, what happens. Because in the first case, what just happens is the ISP or our customer, uh, ISPA or our customer came back to you and say we can't reach the website. And then we say, well, we're actually delivering it. You know, we're sending out the packet. It leaves our cluster. It goes to your transit provider. Tibi then figured out that his own transit provider was filtering it. Another scenario is incomplete route announcements. So what we have seen so far is basically just more specifics, which are either on the left or on the right side of a link. What we also see a lot, and that is true for the Middle East, but also for North Africa, that particular provider there have three, four, five transit providers, but the amount of prefixes they are actually giving to the providers is always not just different, but they are also different prefixes. So let's say they have five prefixes and five transit provider. Every transit provider gets one fifth or one part of the chunk. None of them actually has all prefixes. They are completely different. So none of them actually has a full view of the customer. And this is how they try to do the load balancing. So that goes a step further than, you know, you announce all your prefixes as an aggregate and then break it out and try to balance depending on which kind of 24 you move left and right. They start with breaking it up completely, and, but as you can see, and then they basically announce it. The Akamai part is quite specific here. So what we do is we actually do not know so much about the end user in the beginning. So UIP at home, we actually don't know. What we know is the resolver, the name server you are using and which is asking us. There's a certain assumption on our side that if your name server is asking us that the prefixes where the eyeballs are in basically are announced in the same blocks. So if you have one big block, then your name server is in it and your eyeball is in that block and everything is fine. If you have the big block and you split off some of the name uh, servers or some of the customers, that is also fine. But if you actually do different announcements in different places and some of them have the name servers and some of them have the eyeballs, then we believe where the name server is is actually also where the rest of the eyeballs are. So in that example, one of the 22s on the lower link to 2002 has the name server in it and it also has uh, one of the eyeball networks. On the upper link to 3003, <laughs> the 222s actually just have the eyeballs in it. So we believe now, and this is why we sent ASPA to the lower cluster, we believe that this is the best connectivity and we can actually reach him. but we map basically the whole traffic from him to that particular cluster. So the blue one is the eyeball network and the, the green one on the lower part is, is the DNS part. If we now start to send that traffic actually, because we sent him to that cluster, then what happens is the cluster on our side, the router, doesn't have the more specific, which just exists on the upper transit link. 
and we can't actually see it because it doesn't come via that path. So, oops. So what we do is we're sending it out via transit. So instead of that, it actually goes the shortest pass and what we have defined as the best performance over the lower part because that's how we have seen the name server and some of the eyeballs. Because the other part of the eyeballs is on the upper link, it leaves then our cluster via transit, which besides the cost implication, has actually a performance implication because now it goes probably through a couple of transit providers. It go, doesn't go the fastest path anymore, which we have found out first for him. It just takes a random path through the internet to him. So the performance he sees now for this green eyeball network or for the green prefix is quite significantly different than the one for the blue because it follows a completely different path. So the, the takeaway from that is if you do traffic engineering and if you actually announce various prefixes and you break them out as more specifics, that's all fine as long you know, as they all have proper connectivity. But incomplete route announcements, at least with how we work, causing actually quite a lot of troubles. So, and it doesn't actually have the best performance. And it is, it's actually also for the transit upstream providers quite difficult sometimes for a traffic perspective or you know, if they don't see all prefixes to, to really balance that part. So if you wanna balance the, the Akamai traffic, then it is probably easier to send us an email, actually tell us what you want, from which cluster you wanna be served, from which country or which transit provider, and then we try to accommodate for that. The worst part on the story is that, as I mentioned before, that the mapping system takes a certain amount of time to actually adjust for it. So you do a change, BGP reconverges, but the mapping system hasn't taken it into account. So you get a certain stage where you believe it is now working or not working to your liking, but after up to 24 hours when our mapping system actually changes the routes and get a new intelligence about the whole routing table, suddenly we react to it. And that doesn't have to be in the same way as you thought you get your traffic engineering done. So you are changing it, you know, with the incomplete announcements, change the 24s on the various links, till suddenly it has reached a level which is to your liking, whatever that ratio might be over the various links. And then you think, oh, it's all done, fine. Let's go home. Next day, you come back, and it's actually probably worse than it was before because the mapping system has reacted to it, chosen a new cluster or reshuffled the traffic, and it is not as you wanted it. So before you play around with it for a week, going back and forth, till you actually find a way how it works, it is probably easier dropping us an email. This is um, the, the story with the, with the Akamai refresh. So it is basically the same example as we had before, just mirrored. So you, you have um, the cluster A and the IX and the transit provider 2002 uh, and 3003. And this basically shows if the mapping system reacts 24 hours later, you probably are not even going to the same cluster anymore. Because if we follow like the name server prefix and you have announced the name server prefix now on the top and not on the bottom anymore, then we think, oh, now the best path is actually via the top and we send it to you from a completely different cluster, which depending on the routing is one or the other links. So it might have worked to to your liking, but it also might have just created a completely new scenario. So this is very specific because normally when you do routing and more specifics, you have an idea, especially after the reconvergence, um, how the traffic level looks like and you had an idea what you wanted to achieve when you move the traffic back and forth. But because we have a reaction time to the whole thing, it might send you to a complete new cluster it is probably quite difficult to find exactly what you wanted. Good. Um, ideal solution is, again, you know, either have more connectivity, so both peer with us, uh, or you break out the more specifics, but you have the aggregate always announced on both sides, and then at least there's connectivity and the mapping system can choose from where to serve you. 
Last example, something completely different. That one we have actually seen in Russia. Normal scenario, quite easy in the beginning. We get a um, 20, probably a more specific 24, announced from a transit provider with his customer on the right side, ASPA, which has that 24. The 24, as you can see, is out of the block of the 20, so it's part of the aggregate. Now comes the funny part. ISPA decides to move transit provider. Funny enough, for whatever reason, the old transit provider allows him to use his 24 and taking it with him, which is a block out of his own aggregate space. If he announces the 24, normally that actually works because you have a more specific in the routing table and then the traffic just gets routed via the normal transit provider 3003. Uh, one minute, then I'm done. And then it goes through. As the cache just knows the route with a 20, but because it has a transit default route on the left side to the up, doesn't know about the more specific, it still sends it to the slash 20. Oops. The traffic goes then through the IX to the other transit provider. And in the Russian case, this transit provider figured it out and said, well, that is not exactly what I wanted because now the traffic I don't get paid. You know, it's appearing with Akamai, it's appearing with the other transit provider. I transport that for free. He's no longer my customer. I'm filtering it now. But if you filter it in that case, well, Again, there are two options. You filter it as a traffic on the interface, which breaks it in the first scenario anyway. Or even if you filter the prefix out, as he does not split up his more specifics in all just 24s or whatever, as he still announces the 20, we still believe that route is valid. This was the story with the promise. You say you have the 20 behind you, but you actually don't have the 24 behind you anymore, and you're even filtering it. So the traffic just get black holed. We had a conversation with the Russian provider which believed he is completely right and this is how it should be done. And it is completely normal that you give your own IP space away and someone else announces it as a more specific, which actually leads to the point that we were black holing the customer and had to de-peer that particular provider because otherwise we would have jeopardized ASPA's end users. Probably the only time we actually ever de one. So if you really, really want to do that, as the transit provider 2002, if you really want to give your own IP space and someone moves it somewhere else, then at least don't create holes. See that whatever you announce is actually reachable. So in that case, break everything you have up in 24s, 22s, whatever it is, and see that you can reach everything and then that particular hole the 24 from ISPA is just not part of your announcement. Done. <laughs> well, short summary is if you do traffic engineering, more specifics are fine. If you want to do more or, you know, if you have a time lag in actually doing something with the Akamai system, sending us an email like appearing.akamai.com is a much better solution than trying it yourself for a week. Thanks. It's difficult if you don't see the stuff here. I know. Just saying. Questions before I get kicked off? Everybody asleep or confused? Good. The confused part is not bad. Just send an email. Thanks. Christian took a long time because the next speaker is also Christian. So you'll have to make up for him. Uh, you want to use your laptop? Or you yeah, yeah, I should use my own laptop. No okay, so you start with the one that you use? Uh, I would like to try yes, this one. It's um, Skype. <coughs> okay. So you have to. Then you yeah, carry this uh, laptop away. Put that away and then we use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one. And It is this one, yeah. Um, good afternoon, or should I say good morning? Ah, I can tell you, I mean, presentations after the lunch, 
are quite tough. Um, okay. I don't see the play button, so ah, yeah, here it is. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay. Um, to make it a bit more entertaining, um, I would like to to split the presentation in two parts: slides and some kind of uh, interaction. I mean, interacting with a browser. And so, uh, f for that, um, I need you to pay a little bit attention while I'm going through the slides. Because during the slides, there would be the slots where I jump to the interactive part and go to the browser. But since I don't want to jump around between um, the slides and the browser, and I mean, that would just cost a lot of time, um, we're going to do it like that, like memory. We go through the slides. Um, you memorize where we have these uh, points when we interact, and then we, done, we do it in one session. Okay, um, so what I'm gonna talk about um, is RIPE Atlas um, and RIPE STAT. So two services provided by the RIPE NCC and um, as a matter of recent announcements, um, I will also present DNSmon, because DNSmon was just, um, uh, well, released as sort of a beta, so um, I will shortly talk about that as well. But let me first talk about Atlas. Um, so what is Atlas? What is RIPE Atlas? Uh, Atlas is a measurement network. A uh, measurement network consisting of a lot of small probes. I, I got a sample of that. These small devices, they do measurements. Um, so, and what kind of measurements? Um, basic measurements like uh, ping, traceroute, uh, SSL, uh, DNS measurements as well. And um, the big benefit of um, having this measurement network built by the RIPE NCC is that we are aiming for uh, quantity. Well, of course, also qu uh, quality. Um, but you will be able to, uh, to use these measurements, the measurement network and the data that it's being um, uh, created. So um, that provides you with the benefit that you don't have to uh, create your own uh, measurement network. So um, just as a simple update um, to where we are with the measurement network, um, we got more than 5,000 probes um, active um, with around 7,000 uh, active users. And with active users, I mean people that are doing measurements, they are creating measurements, and um, we are collecting the measurements. So, well, you see another image of the, of the probe that I just showed you. Um, and the other graph shows the distribution of the Atlas probes all over the world. And you see there is I mean, at the moment, there's sort of a concentration around Europe and North America. And that's also reflected in the next graph. Um, that's the density uh, map. So basically, per country, you see uh, how many probes we have there. The darker the color, the more probes we have there. Um, and what we're going to see in the UAE uh, is that at the moment, I mean, the slides are a bit out, out of date because uh, at the moment we have 10 active uh, probes there. Um, but we hope to get more and more. Um, a sort of a um, recap from the last MINOG uh, in Kuwait. We started out with uh, two probes. And after, right after the MINOG uh, 13, we had uh, five probes. So, um, I mean, that shows that had some effect, and I hope that after we leave, um, we get more probes uh, active in, in, this re in this area. Okay, um, then a feature um, that has been, yeah, um, sort of heavily, um, was heavily promoted by the RIPE NCC uh, is the uh, Anchor project. I mean, you can imagine that um, these kind of devices have some kind of limitation uh, when it comes to measurements. 
Um, so what we thought about um, is sort of some super probes um, which are able to conduct more measurements and also act as a target. And uh, I think that's the, that's the interesting part with the, with the anchors um, and also the benefits um, that with these super probes or enhanced probes um, we can create a more dense measurement and if we have a, a local uh, representation of one of the anchors it is also possible to use them as targets. So uh, you get more measurements from within, within that area where the anchor is um, uh, hosted. And if we look at the distribution or the amount of anchors we have in the Middle East, then it looks quite bad. And um, I hope we can also change that by um, convincing you of the benefit you get if you host a probe. Um, and by, by becoming a host um, or um, host of a probe, uh, it's actually quite easy. Um, if you go to this URL, um, you find a step-by-step -step, um, um, information um, how you can apply for a probe and then you buy the hardware. We're going to install the software and then you connect it to the network and uh, it's up and running. Um, just one note for the um, requirements. Um, I mean, the, the probes, they are not meant to, or the anchors are not meant to uh, be put behind the home network because they are much more powerful. So uh, it would be best if you can uh, host it in your uh, data center. And um, for that, we got some kind of requirements. For example, it's one unit, one rack unit. Um, and some kind of recommendation for the bandwidth. Um, we stated 10 megabits, um, but that's not accurate um, at the moment because the 10 megabits, uh, they were created um, with the future development in mind. At the moment, we're hovering around uh, 200K. Okay. So um, then I'm going to switch to some recent developments or some things that we recently added to, um, to the Atlas project. Um, one of the first things is uh, status checks. So as I said before, um, Atlas is a measurement network and um, you're able to use the power of Atlas to monitor your own network. And we implemented sort of a neat feature um, which basically consists of ping measurements that you create towards, your, uh, towards the host that you want to monitor. And on top of that data, um, we built some kind of wrapper that um, let you monitor changes within the ping results. So uh, you can define uh, specific um, uh, thresholds for which you, for which you get um, uh, basically alerted. And it's pretty simple. So you're gonna create a measurement, um, then you get a URL, and in this URL um, you fetch the results from the, from the status checks, and in the simplest case, um, you see that the status check or the alert gets triggered or doesn't get triggered. I mean, that depends on what kind of criteria you uh, set for that. And I mean, that makes it also quite handy um, if you use this data call um, for sort of monitoring softwares like uh, Nagios or Isinger. And uh, with, with this one, it's, it's quite easy to build, for example, a dashboard where you can easily monitor your, uh, your network. Um, there's just one thing that I have to mention for the uh, status checks. Uh, it is still in a beta status, so um, it will change. I mean, the feature set is not complete yet. Um, and it might be if, because um, we, we tried to test it first, and if it's not really um, well received within the community, it could be that we, we cancel that feature, although I think that's that's rather unlikely. Then, um, another nice uh, feature that we, that we added, um, for those of you that were already using um, RIPE Atlas and um, in, the in, uh, in the in the um, configuration pages for uh, RIPE Atlas, we um, 
visualize the data, um, like pin data trace route, um, in our graphs. But our graphs are sort of, um, yeah, unflexible, so we replace that with um, um, AJAX-based uh, uh, JavaScript visualizations. Um, where you can zoom in, zoom out, and um, I showed it just before to one of the attendees. Um, if you want to see um, the overview of the ping results for example one year, then you can easily see that and wherever you see some peaks or spikes, then you can zoom in and dig into the, into the details. So I think that's, that's quite handy if you uh, want to troubleshoot some, some problems that were in the past or even uh, recent problems. Um, um, another visualization that came out of uh, the Atlas data uh, is the so-called seismograph. Um, it's basically ping data, um, but involving multiple different probes. So you can take five, ten different probes. They're going to um, constantly measure uh, one target and present it in one screen. And with that visualization you can easily uh, spot, uh, for example, slow servers. Um, on RIPE Labs there is a nice article um, which explains the details about that, but I'm not going into the details about that. Then another feature is the quick look. Um, the quick look um, lets you uh, execute a measurement um, in, well, in, in one go. So basically what we have, um, we have different levels of measurements. Um, there are the building measurements. Building measurements are uh, measurements that as soon as you plug in the probe, they're gonna start to measure um, pins to uh, fixed locations. Then you can create your own measurements. And additionally, as a subset of these user-defined measurements, you have um, one-offs. And that means that if you go to the quick look page and you just want to know the um, visibility or reachability of one of your hosts, you put in your IP address and then um, you're gonna trigger a measurement from different probes towards this location. And that gives you a, an easy view, an easy external view towards one of your hosts. Um, I, w I mean, this is the part where um, I would like to uh, get into some kind of interactive session, so I will show you the, the uh, quick look later on. Um, then, another um, aspect of the, uh, of the measurements, of the forms of me measurements that we support, is uh, HTTP measurement. And, I mean, for this I just wanted to mention that uh, since it also involves some content, and uh, content could be sometimes critical according, I mean, uh, if you think about local laws. Um, so that's why what we, um, what we did to, to make that in a way safe is restricted to only anchors um, can act as targets for HTTP measurements. But this is something that's still in discussion and uh, will go on. Okay, then uh, three more use cases for, uh, for Atlas. Um, one could be the reachability of KRoot. So um, the map shows different anchor probe, uh, Atlas probes, and uh, they do a DNS measurement towards uh, KRoot. And um, if it's reachable, then it's green. If it's not reachable, well, then it's unreachable. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, in a way. Um, the next one uh, is Additionally to the reachability, we can also see which instance, I mean, KROAD is any cast, uh, we see on which instance uh, a probe measurement ends, ends up. All right. Then we come to the next part of the topic. Um, that's WipeStat. So, who of you knows about RIPESTAT? Okay, all right. <laughs> then I think it makes sense that I go through that a little bit uh, with more details. So, um, RIPESTAT. RIPESTAT um, was created as kind of an interface to 
internet number related data. So around three years ago, we realized that we are sitting on a lot of data. We have uh, registration data, we have routing data, we have DNS data, geolocation data, but um, there was not a single tool to interact or to, to get the data. I mean, there were um, separate web pages where you could go to the data, but nothing under one hood. And the idea was to create this tool set in a way that it's modular and also extendable. Yeah, and uh, one thing that's, I think, quite important to mention is that RIPESTAT is user-driven. And that turned out to be quite successful. Um, so, I mean, when we started, um, I think we still, um, that was quite on an early age, but uh, after three years, um, I think right now it's, it's quite mature. So, um, what I wanted to uh, talk about was, yeah, the architecture um, of RIPESTAT, because I think that's very interesting. Um, if, if someone is familiar with the MVC uh, concept in web development, I mean, you have a model, you have a business logic, and you have a presentation layer. We did a similar thing with RIPESTAT. We have the data API um, that is implemented in sort of a RESTful um, architecture. So basically, you map data on URLs. And the only thing that you use in this sense are, is um, an URL to get to the data. The data API just provides you with raw data. So if you want to have routing information, then you go to one URL. If you want to have geolocation information, then you go to another URL. And the result comes back in, uh, in plain text. Um, I mean, we prefer to use JSON, but um, it also supports uh, YAML. And if, if uh, the um, demand for, his, uh, for, for uh, XML is there, then we could also uh, support XML. Then, on top of the data API, we're going to visualize the data or interpret the data. And uh, that's been done with uh, web technologies. So we are using HTML, JavaScript, and CSS for that. And when, when we created the widget API, we kept uh, one thing in mind, that whenever we do a visualization, it should be possible that you're going to grab that visual visualization and put it on any other web page. Um, I think it becomes much clearer um, if we go to the interactive part, and I can show you um, the different APIs. But I think what, what, we, uh, what you should uh, take away from, uh, from this slide right now is um, that if you like one of the widgets, you can implement it, you can use it on your own page quite easily. Then on top of uh, the widget API, we have sort of a container, and uh, that is RIPESTAT. Um, that provides you with some features like um, you can create your own set of, uh, of widgets. Um, but I think that's also something that I, I will show you uh, in the live demo. Okay, this would be the time when I'm gonna switch to the live demo, but we're gonna do that at the end of the presentation. Okay, then um, I promised you to talk about DNS Mon and um, just one slide about that. So DNS Mon is a service um, to monitor the quality Seriously, five minutes? Ooh, gosh, okay. Um, so DNS Mon is a, a service um, that let, well, is a service to monitor uh, DNS servers, uh, high level DNS servers. And it's also based on Atlas data, so um, the, the data that's being visualized in DNS Mon comes from the Atlas network. And um, at the moment, we have sort of a, a limited group of uh, DNS servers, so it's the, the root servers, and some TLDs. That means uh, some CC TLDs and some generic top-level domains. And, well, I mentioned that before, um, DNS Mon is released at a public beta. That means you can take a look um, at it under atlas.right.net slash DNS Mon, um, but it is still in some kind of progress and will change. 
Okay, um, before I mentioned that RIPESTAT is being developed in some kind of um, um, structure that we incorporate user feedback and then we're gonna um, develop based on the user feedback. That's why it is important that you get involved, that you're gonna tell us what you think about the service and what we can improve. And um, we have three different uh, channels. If you want to provide feedback for RIPE Atlas, then please send a mail to atlas at ripe.net. If you want to provide feedback for RIPE stat, stat at ripe.net. For DNS Mon, it is DNS Mon dot at ripe, at ripe dot net. Yeah. Um, and if you're interested in the things that are we are that we are developing at the moment, or that we already um, developed or plan to develop, then you can go to the roadmap. That would be roadmap.ripe.net. Uh, and yeah, that would go over to the questions right now. But since we, how many minutes do we have left? Oh, gosh. Ah, that, that will be really short. Okay. Can I steal some minutes? Gosh, really? So, okay, I think then we have the, the resolution problem. Yeah. Is it possible that we see it entirely? Um, I'm gonna change the zoom level, so we should be able to see a little bit. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, usually you should not see this kind of um, rendering problems um, because the resolution on the on the uh, Bima is really low. I think it's something around 800. So this is RIPESTAT. RIPESTAT. Um, gives you information for internet uh, um, related numbers, uh, uh, internet number related resources, sorry. Um, so it supports uh, lookups for prefixes, um, for uh, ASNs, um, for domain names, these are the fully qualified domain names, as well as country um, codes, so basically countries. And uh, what you see um, is a mixture between routing information. So you, for example, see if something is announced or is not announced. Geolocation information, uh, that data comes from MaxMind, so it's usage-based. Usage -based. Um, and um, yeah, we also have uh, a widget um, to help you with the, with the RIPE database. Because I mean the RIPE database, um, everyone who worked with the RIPE database knows that it sometimes could be a difficult to find your way through all the objects and how they are linked. Um, you could use the register browser for that to easily jump from one object to another. And you always see the links or the reference between of objects. Then there's another widget the routing uh, status, which gives you a condensed view of routing information about the visibility, about which AS is announcing it, um, since when it, it has been seen on the, on the internet. So a couple of really useful information. And all together, um, we have something around 40 widgets. So I think we would not have the time to explain all of them. But um, for all of our services, we have documentation pages. So if you just wish, visit, uh, visit stat.ripe.net or atlas.ripe.net, um, then you will find the information you're looking for. And then one thing that I would like to add, um, tomorrow we're gonna have um, a tutorial because right now it's really just an overview of the services. Uh, tomorrow we will have more time to go into more details and that could mean that we uh, build something like a dashboard with the RIPE NCC tools. So um, I think it could be very interesting for, um, for sysadmins to attend the tutorial. Okay, do we have any questions? Yes. Hi. 
uh, hardware privacy and price for Atlas? Uh, for the anchors, you mean? Yeah. I mean, these things, we're going to... Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Dragos Marek. Uh, I work for Simplex Dust. Hardware, pricing, privacy. Okay. The small devices, uh, we, dinner, uh, we distribute for free. Um, I mean, of course, you can always become a, a sponsor for that. Uh, so um, that's always welcome. But for the Atlas anchors, um, you need to buy a, a Sucris box. And, um, well, I, I don't have the exact price. For, it's 700 euros, yeah, for that. So you can either buy it from your preferred seller or um, we have a list of, of uh, resellers that, um, where you can buy the, the, the boxes from. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Hi, Shakil from Pakistan. Hmm. Is there any measurement tool for IPv4 or IPv6 address space to check how many IP, ad, uh, how many IP addresses of a prefix are assigned to the system or end user devices? I mean live IP addresses that are being used at a particular time. You mean for a network? Yeah. Okay, yeah. It is, I mean, I'm, I'm really sorry. The, the time is just not enough to, to present all of the um, uh, data we have. I mean, I would recommend if you just go to, to Ripestat and uh, type in your AS name, um, AS number, um, and then just click through the, the tabs I mean, we ordered the tab in the way that um, you can find either use cases or data it is based on. And if you see the routing uh, tab, it's the second one, um, that will show you the information you are looking for. And I mean, maybe it's possible that you come tomorrow for the tutorial, then we, I can show it to you in more details. That's an interesting question because, I mean, you would see the, the prefix in the routing table. Okay, um, but you don't really know how many IP addresses within that prefix are used. Um, we have a cooperation with M-Labs um, and they do um, um, some kind of the usage, um, IP address usage. <laughs> so um, under the activity tab on RIPESTAT, you will find, I think it's the second widget, which gives you information about the activity, the network activity, within a, a prefix. And there you could find it, yeah. I mean, I, I would... You'll have to take it offline. Do it tomorrow. Come to it yeah. tomorrow. Tomorrow. Sorry. Okay, do we have another question? Kavir? Yeah, Kavir Ryan for Ripe NCC. Just to wrap it up, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, these tools, both Ripe Atlas and Ripe Stat, they are very unique uh, measurement and diagnostic tools both in scale and uh, also functionality. So uh, I would suggest that if you have any questions or if you want to participate of, or if you want to know more, please talk to one of my colleagues or me or uh, you can uh, come to the tutorial tomorrow. But they are very useful for also, uh, you will see a lot of benefits uh, in, uh, if you start using them in your network. So please, it's, it's all yours. It's, it's developed by the RIPE community for the, for the whole internet community. So please use them. Yeah. I mean, I will be around till the evening and also at the socials. And yeah, it would be nice to see some of you at the tutorial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah if, if you want to know more about it, there's a tutorial on right Atlas and Start tomorrow. Please come to that. It's in one of these rooms around here. Um, I think it's here. The room are getting divided. It's somewhere else? Huh? It's where? Okay, you'll figure that out. So before I ask Martin to come back, uh, one last chance of doing peering personals. I don't have space in the fourth session because a lot of IXPs have sent their updates. So if anyone has another next five minutes to send a slide, it'll get in into this session. Otherwise, uh, you know, the one after that is mostly IXPs. I think I have received a slides from almost everyone I can see. I think few IXPs are missing, so please send your slides as well. 
Martin Levy will talk about NECAS CDN. All right, so it's me between you and the break. So I, 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 I understand why that puts me, and I will be efficient, very efficient. Um, just to repeat it, I'm Martin Levy from Cloudflare, and um, as much as I've talked over many years about V6, um, and I have done other, other things. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Anycast in a, in, a, in a CDN world, which is slightly different. I didn't do this earlier, but just so that we put this in the right context, the one simple who we are slide. In the CDN world, um, this is sort of well understood that you're dealing with moving content closer to the end user, but it turns out you can actually do a lot more than that. You can actually um, improve security. You can do analysis. You can actually um, uh, put on third-party services. Um, but the reality is that for what we're... Ooh, hold on. Did you select the PDF file? Yeah. Hmm. Is the PowerPoint on here? Okay, all right. Um, that will be a problem. Um, so, yeah, let's see how this goes. In the CDN that, that, that Cloudflare works, we work in, a, um, in an Anycast uh, model, which means that we... Um, actually have traffic coming to all of our sites around the world within a single IP address, a slightly different model than you heard previously. And um, it gives you a different style of result. Um, the map, the usual sort of diagram, but this is the part that, that I've got the slides out of order. I, that's why I realized that there was a slightly different uh, a file up there. Um, I'll come back to this one. All right, so in the Anycast world, although it's done for V4 and V6, all of the sites around the world announce the same IP address. What this means is that the BGP routing tables that operate within all of the different backbones will see what looks like an equivalent route although they're being sourced from different locations. And they'll make a choice as to where to go to based upon their own local set of rules and based upon sort of the standard BGP rules, which have been around for quite some time. Um, the ability to use an Anycast route um, has been well understood for things like DNS. But to use it for TCP connections as well has been something that only uh, has been done in, in recent years. It means that if you have a particular, um, if you're in a particular geography, you're in Germany, you have a statistically very high chance that you're going to have the most efficient route to, let's say, a cluster of servers in Frankfurt. If you're in the middle of the United States, well, you may go to Dallas or you may go to Chicago. That depends upon the geography of the, of the broadband or the eyeball network or wherever you're, you're browsing from. If you look at a good example of this, although I don't know how well this is easy to, 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 to see, uh, three different trace routes, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, and here in Dubai. Uh, in Hong Kong, you see just a few milliseconds because the route is local. In Singapore, you see the exact same quick route, but it's going to a different location. It's staying in Singapore. But here in Dubai, you end up in, I think this is in London um, that, this, uh, that this terminates in. Because to be honest, that's the closest node to here without any deployment in the region. That's what Anycast provides you, each site having the ability to, to choose uh, appropriately. This does not work 
<laughs> this does not work as a PDF, but, but let's, let's. No, it's okay. We'll, 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 we'll talk about this in the highest level possible. Um, imagine, actually this should be faster actually, that's a good point. Imagine that there is automation on this slide. In, in the blue, we have DNS requests. A user goes to any DNS server. We, we actually distribute our DNS servers uh, as most people do these days. And the DNS server comes back with just an IP address. It doesn't come back with a location. It doesn't come back with, a, um, with anything that, that is computed. It just comes back with the IP address. That gets routed by the user, which would be the, 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 the red in this case, the one that's, that's on the, the left, um, to the closest server. But if that server doesn't exist, if that server goes away, if that pop goes away, then it'll pick the next location, the next nearest location to go to. And this will uh, continue and work for um, users basically anywhere in the world. And it, it's a V4 or a V6 capability. The interesting thing about, um, about this technique is that although you get to the closest server, you still need to know how to get to the content. And one of the slides earlier talks about this in the sense that we still get to the content, we still pull the content that fills the cache using a standard unicast methodology, the IP address behind the servers, a different IP address that exists at every server. The reason is, is that that makes more sense because you need to go greater distance. You need to be able to pull the connectivity from a long way away. Now, I had a slide earlier about this. I'm going to go back um, and talk about V4 and V6. This is the identical service for V4 and V6. But what's interesting out of this environment is that when we talk about the connectivity on the outside of a cache, outside of a, a content delivery network, we actually talk about something where it's disconnected TCP-wise from the internal connection, the the connection that brings the data from the origin, from the original source. And so those two protocols don't need to be the same. In the Cloudflare model, we actually can enable by default V6 to the end user, to the, to, to the delivery on the outside of the CDN. Immaterial of whether the inside um, source, the original source is actually V4 or V6. And so we have this ability to give you um, essentially an automatic gateway into the V6 world. And the, and the functionality works identical. So let's go back and move forward. How do you do this? Well, it turns out that, that the, the problems of doing, uh, uh, of doing any cast are slowly being understood by the industry. But the reality is you have to pick how you interconnect. If you use disparate transit providers in different places around the world, you actually start getting inconsistent routing. So one of the, the, cons one of the constraints is that you have to be fairly consistent in the use of, of your transit providers globally if you want to have global um, uh, connectivity. So we had to choose either one provider per region or a single provider over multiple regions. Um, we found that using a single provider was easier. But when I say single provider, what I really mean is the same provider in every location. It doesn't mean a single provider is in single home. You can actually be multi-homed, have multiple providers, as long as every provider can exist in every location that you are uh, that you're, uh, operating in. Um, if you do peering, um, life gets a little interesting, but in, the important point to realize is that your, your transits also do peering. They also do interconnects. So occasionally you need to tune them if you find that they have inconsistencies. And I'll give you a simple example of that. Um, we have seen carriers here in the, um, both in the Middle East and, and also <laughs> in other areas like, like uh, India, who use different transit providers for the eastbound and westbound connectivity. And that will very much mess with an anycast uh, environment. And technically, it, it actually messes with a unicast environment, but you don't notice it as quickly. So we have this uh, requirement to sort of play uh, and, and measure and then turn off 
uh, anybody who is, is doing that and, and, and edit the uh, transit usage so we get a consistent east-west or, or anywhere to anywhere routing. Um, you end up using a lot of the routing controls, the, the community controls that exist in the various networks. And, and that can be fairly easy to read up. The URL for one such uh, source is here. And there's been some good talks about using communities uh, in various different areas. Um, I can talk about specific routing uh, on specific backbones, uh, but I will hit a couple of key points. Um, although the US and Europe become amazingly consistent as far as interconnection. Uh, Asia is somewhat the opposite. We do see some disconnects between different, uh, between different uh, uh, major providers there. Um, what's interesting is that those providers um, fully expect to, to have a disparate um, a set of customer base. When you run uh, in any cast environment, you have to sort of measure that and make sure that you, you balance appropriately. All right, let's talk about peering because we're a peering forum. So can you get away with just doing peering if you're doing any cast? And the answer is, eh, you've got to be careful as well. Um, it turns out that outside of the economy of peering, you actually have to start looking also at who shows up where. You don't want to see people that have peering routes showing up outside of the continent or even outside of the country that you have pops in. If you put a pop into Sweden, you want to get all of your routes in Sweden as close to that as possible and not have uh, stuff go away. This becomes actually, as I said, quite hard in, 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 in Asia. But in, in Europe, it's, it's uh, quite doable. In, in North America, it's essentially doable. You have a different variable, which is you have to look at some of the content networks. Interesting subtle point about Asia is that if you look at places like Hong Kong, you actually end up having an enormous, if not complete, set of local routes uh, on some of the exchanges there. And that provides for some very uh, efficient uh, delivery of content in places like that. That's probably an exception to, to anywhere in the world. So a couple of the challenges, we'll just run through this. Um, doing any cast um, uh, definitely means you have to spend a lot more time focusing on routing. You have to definitely turn up peers carefully. You, in fact, actually our whole methodology is to turn up peers and then measure where they are and then to finally enable the Anycast routing onto them. Um, we've had some great examples of uh, networks in Russia, for example, who are quite happy to send all the traffic towards Hong Kong when, in fact, it's clear that they are much closer to places like Frankfurt. Um, you sometimes have a hard time explaining this to, to networks. Um, to, to explain to them that, that routing should not be equal, equal um, costing in, in, in directions like that. Um, and of course, as you deploy into new markets, um, uh, you end up having a, a whole set of unique routing environments. And it's going to be very interesting to see how routing here in the Middle East comes out. Um, but the good news about the Middle East, um, which may sound very strange, is because there aren't that many global backbones, with a presence in, in the Middle East, um, that it turns out that you actually get spot uh, uh, routing. You get routing that's specific to certain carriers. And that probably means that any cast will work quite well here. That's all I really wanted to talk about. I really wanted to get through these slides quickly as a, a respect for tea break, uh, coffee break. Um, I'll take questions now or after. Thank you. Questions for Martin? Everybody wants tea. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Martin. Um, and uh, and as, as I said in the start of the session in the morning, uh, we need more volunteers, we need more speakers. Uh, I don't want to bring the same people here three times a day on different pretexts. Uh, that's fine. Uh, in the initial few years, uh, but hopefully we'll see more and more new people and new participants. So the peering personnel for this session, this one should be it. Do. Hello everybody. 
my name is Amitesh. I work with Do. We are a second telecom provider in UAE. Uh, we provide both fixed and mobile services to this part of the region. We are present in UAIX at London Internet Exchange, M6, DKIX, and also at Econix Singapore. Uh, we have an open peering policy and uh, we have more of a balanced traffic. You can contact me for bringing in uh, new sessions. We are open to bring peering. Thank you. Thank you, Amitesh. So, hi, I'm Andrew Basket. CK is tired of coming up here. So I'm at Akamai Technologies. We're a content provider, 21 tera of traffic, and we have the most open peering policy. So please come and peer us up here with us, over 65 locations worldwide, and in the region at UAEIX, GCCIX, in uh, Bahrain. Thanks. Uh, thank you. That ends the peering personals. Uh, as I said, uh, we won't have, I, I, don't, I guess we can still add just one or two, but uh, thank you very much for everyone who made the peering personals. We'll compile all of this together and it'll show up on the website uh, maybe by today evening. Uh, or by tomorrow at least. So you don't have to write it down, you'll see all of them on the website. Um, and then we'll have a tea break and we'll have one more session which will be focused more on IXPs. Let me get you the agenda for that one. Uh, we should have the agenda somewhere. Yep, that is the session in, well, half an hour from now. Hmm? 20 minutes. Uh, and I think uh, you can bring in your coffee and tea in the room uh, because we'll have a second coffee break, a closing coffee break when we end. So I think we probably want to start a lot sooner than 20 minutes, so maybe 15, just enough time to get your things and bring it in, uh, and then we get started. Uh, and then, you know, Sirs will do the next one. Uh, and if, if you are an IXP and haven't sent me your single slide, you have another 10 minutes to do so. And after that, we're done. Thank you very much. <laughs>